Um, firstly, thank you very much for uh, joining us this evening here at the University of New South Wales. Uh, I'm glad you've found the uh, appropriate lecture theatre. There may well be another hundred people wandering the university looking for it, but we'll presume everybody found it. Uh, thanks for taking some time out uh, on a Tuesday night to join us. Of course, uh, Chris Davison, who most of you who will know, you will know, is the head of the School of Education here at the University of New South Wales, and uh, Parsi Salberg, who is uh, will be in October uh, employed here as a uh, as a professor uh, with the Gonski Institute for Education. Uh, we have many other. Uh, senior members of the university uh, and I'm just going to call out one because this just reminds me of my own university days a long time ago and that's the Vice-Chancellor Ian Jacobs who's sitting up the back, he just got off an aeroplane from Melbourne and wanted to join us and all I'd say is Ian just make sure you take notes because there will be an exam at the uh, at the end of this. So I've always wanted to say that to a Vice-Chancellor. <laughs> <laughs> and don't think you're going to leave early. He's not been up on the sleep. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you very much. I, you, I know the vice chair has had a busy day in Melbourne today, and it's, uh, uh, it's been it's great that you could join us. So, uh, firstly, I, I I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land upon which we gather here this evening, the Bidjigal people, and pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And I would like also to extend that. Any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person present here this evening. This evening is uh, an opportunity uh, for a discussion around uh, Gonski 2.0. Uh, I bring a certain perspective as a former uh, education minister, obviously deeply involved in issues of uh, macro policy, uh, development impl implementation, uh, pol uh, um, policy argy bargy. Uh, as it's technically referred to uh, in, in politics, because uh, education policy and Gonski, the first Gonski, the second Gonski, uh, will never escape uh, the clutches of politics. And what will happen, or what might not happen with this report, uh, will indeed be influenced by politics. But we would certainly hope uh, far more significantly influenced by uh, the people in this room, uh, including, of course, the other two people here as part of the panel. So um, obviously um, Chris in her role here at the University of New South Wales and her many roles before that, an expert in, uh, in assessment. Parsi of course brings uh, the international perspective to uh, this discussion around Gonski 2.0. Uh, what, what is its application here in Australia? Uh, how does it fit into what other systems around the world might be doing? Um, and, uh, and potentially some of the additional things that uh, might be considered in any kind of response to Gonski uh, 2.0. So we, we will just make a few comments and then we'll essentially we'll open it up to, to the floor for some, some questions directed at any person or, uh, or, or all three. So um, my, my, my introductory remarks would be, would be this around this element of, of the politics of, of Gonski 2.0. And that is to remember why the federal government commissioned it, because the arguments around school funding, needs-based funding, equity-based funding, uh, hadn't gone away. As we know, the process went through with the Gillard government and then um, some funds committed, then uh, the Abbott government, and uh, again, all the argy-bargy about school funding. But one of the, one of the very loud arguments around needs-based funding was that we're spending all this extra money and, the, and education is not improving or going backwards. So in any further political argument around uh, additional funding, and the Commonwealth, I think, uh, were well-intentioned in wanting to put more funding. You can argue about the dollar figure. But they also wanted to make this point, both at a policy and at a political level, about how do we most effectively spend the money that we are spending in education to get the kind of improvement that I guess we all want in, edu in, in education. The media wants certain outcomes, uh, government wants certain outcomes, uh, parents and of course students want uh, certain outcomes as well. They're not always necessarily the same. So they wanted to see some evidence about some research, some 
a report, a review around what is the most effective way uh, to spend that money. What's going to happen now with the report, the Commonwealth will put in a, um, will, is preparing a response, but that will be a negotiated response with state governments as well. So um, every few years, uh, depending on what part of the cycle you're at, there is a funding agreement signed between the Commonwealth and state governments. And then what usually happens, and I've been part of those discussions, is the Commonwealth will seek to make states do things by dangling a big bucket of money in front of them. So in terms of the implementation of some of the recommendations of Gonski 2.0 will be dictated by, um, I, would, I would certainly hope, the uniformed approach to, to these funding agreements between the state and the Commonwealth. We don't want different agreements with different states because that's where we start getting into the inequity around school funding. We, we want a commonality, uh, but we don't also want it to be compromised by the kinds of um, political, well, the political compromises that sometimes occur uh, in order for the Commonwealth to get what, it's, what it wants and the states to get the money that it wants. So uh, we've got to be very vigilant, I think, as people involved in education, and I, and I now sit on the other side of the table as part of this, these discussions, part of this advocacy around uh, school funding, about how we spend school, um, how we spend uh, money in, in education, uh, policy alternatives, policy options. Uh, we've got to make sure that it is actually driven by uh, good quality evidence, good quality uh, research, and driven by what the profession is saying needs to happen in schools. And I certainly hope that with whatever they come up with as part of these agreements, that the, that the perspective of the teaching profession uh, and, and principals uh, are uh, very much at the forefront because we, we know that um, if it does not have buy-in from the profession, then the very outcomes that they want from 2.0 are not going to come. If it doesn't work in the classroom, then it doesn't work and we will, we will continue to have the same arguments about money and spending and effectiveness and results and we'll still be arguing about PISA, our, our rankings in, in 10 years' time and in, and in 20 years' time. So I certainly hope as a result of this, the argument certainly at a political level, I'll let these two experts talk about it an ex, at an educational level, I certainly hope at a, a political level that the discussion is more around education policy than it is about, about politics and, uh, and sometimes the unfortunate compromises that come as a result. Chris, you are a, an expert in assessment. Um, a number of the recommendations deal with uh, a new um, model of assessment. Uh, would you like to have a, Would you like to say a few words about your reflections on Gonski 2.0 from that perspective and your other perspective as having been the dean, uh, the, the head of the School of Education here for uh, I won't say how long, but quite a few years. <laughs> a decade <laughs> <laughs> and a bit longer too. Um, well, f first of all, I'd like to say that um, many people have commented perhaps that the Gonski document is simply um, tracking a, an evolving um, developments in uh, Australian education. But last week I was um, talking through the Gonski 2 document with some senior policymakers in Beijing, in China, and I presented to them the recommendations from the Gongski um, document, Gongski 2. And I realised from that perspective how transformational the document is. And perhaps people don't realise so much what it actually is committing us to. I think for the first time uh, it's committing the whole of the education system and all educational leaders to delivering one year of growth for every one year of learning for each student. For decades that has been seen as something that the teacher has to do, often behind closed doors by themselves without any additional resources or training. Uh, it's been something that teacher education has more recently uh, been asked to do, to show how graduate 
student teachers will impact on students' learning. It's something that implicitly or explicitly parents have been asked to contribute to. But I think in the Gonski 2 document, what I really notice um, and reflected in sort of the, the inward gasp of astonishment of many of the Chinese policymakers when they read it is that it's really committing seriously the whole of the education system to delivering on that. And I think if it's taken seriously, they will realise what a big ask that is because too often people... People assume that there's some kind of um, generic norm who is uh, occup uh, occupying our classrooms. Um, you you develop a, a generic, a good idea for teaching, and you can scale it up without much difficulty. We just need to find the good ideas and get the teachers to implement it. But we know that demographically, Australia is very, has a very very uh, varied population and continually changing and often that's not recognised in policy documents at all. I, I perhaps think that it needs to be foregrounded more in the Gonski too, but the fact that the recommendations are focused on delivering an extra year of growth for every child, irrespective of whether they're a refugee who arrived from Syria last week after many, many months, even years of trauma and in refugee camps and so on, speaking no English, irrespective of whether they're an Aboriginal child from the other side of far western New South Wales with de very difficult access to schooling, um, irrespective of whether they're uh, a child of a, a broken family with parents suffering mental health issues and, and arriving at school uh, without sufficient um, nutrition or clothing. Uh, irrespective of these sorts of things, irrespective of whether they're a, a child from an Arabic background, a boy who is really gifted but not gifted in ways that get picked up by our uh, tests for selective schools and entry. So we have very varied population in Australia and particularly in New South Wales. And one of the things I'm really excited about with the Gonski 2 document is the way in which they will, I think, perhaps for the first time really seriously have to address that diversity and resource the learning and teaching of those students in schools. So that's my first thing I'll say as the head of the School of Education. <laughs> as somebody with some interest and expertise in assessment, albeit the teacher-based classroom embedded assessment for learning kind, I rejoice in the fact that the Gonski Institute has finally, it's not the Gonski Institute, sorry, the Gonski 2 report, but the Gonski Institute as well, uh, is finally um, making sure that the kind of informal everyday assessment while teaching work that teachers and students do in classrooms that is absolutely essential to improving uh, student learning, to delivering on that goal of making sure that every child has a year of growth for a year of education. That kind of uh, assessment for learning um, that values teachers' expertise, that builds teachers' strategic questioning skills, that builds their sensitivity and understanding to using wait time um, in order to support all the students in the class, that builds on their skills of developing high quality assessments and builds on their very uh, systematic and well-tuned observation skills will finally be recognised and supported uh, and hopefully translated into uh, a very um, useful uh, online resource for teacher development, which will also provide an opportunity for um, parents and students to access the same uh, resources so that everybody is on the same page in terms of talking about what is growth and what is learning and um, what is realistic for students to uh, learn in one year of learning. Um, so that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> uh, Parsi, from an international perspective and your own, um, your own in-depth knowledge about education, thoughts, question mark. Okay, good evening everybody. How are we going? It's all right? 
it's a, obviously it's a huge uh, challenge uh, at the same time when it's a, it's a great uh, honor and pleasure to be here. But the challenge because my, my history with this wonderful country of Australia is barely six years old. I remember actually it was a day after the first Konski review was published when I landed first time ever in my life uh, in Melbourne, in, Aus in Australia, of course. Uh, and one of the first things that I was asked to do that time was to make a similar type of response and commentary <laughs> on the first uh, Konsky, uh, Konsky report. I must say that I, if I remember correctly that I, I, I was really excited about the first Konsky review, uh, particularly because it was uh, it was uh, pointing towards this, exactly the same types of things that were so familiar to me back home in Finland. I spent uh, uh, a good uh, a decade with the uh, Finnish government working for, for the kind of a entire education system and then rest of my time there with the uh, higher education institutions and schools as a school teacher. So I was looking at these things from the kind of a uh, strictly Finland perspective. That time, of course, I didn't know anything about Australia. I had no idea what had happened here before. And today, I don't know too much more than that. So, so you have to, I ask you to bear with me if I say something uh, absolutely stupid or something that is uh, uh, even uh, entirely inappropriate, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I take this privilege of being an alien and somebody who is uh, ignorant in this way. But thank you very much for giving this opportunity to make some uh, responses and comments. I'll try to keep this very brief so that we can have a, have a conversation. But I basically have three things to say if I'm asked to make a kind of a response, a reaction to Konski 2.0. First one of them is uh, I always try to look at the kind of a positive, the good side. What, what is coming, what good things are coming with this? Or what, what are the opportunities that we see, or you could see, or we all now can see um, over here. The second one is the, I call them um, opportunities to do more. If you, uh, you want to hear it, otherwise you, you may also hear it as what is the problem. Uh, with this as I see it. And then of course, what are some of the open questions questions that I have in mind when I've been back and forth of the, uh, of the report uh, during the last uh, few few weeks. I think the first thing really, if I start, uh, start from the beginning, is that, um, you know, I, I, as Adrian said, that when I read the, the Konski 2.0 review report, I read it as a kind of an initial political statement. And that's how I think it, that's how it should be read. It's not the kind of a technical paper or report that gives you a kind of an idea what to do exactly. I, I think it's very important that whoever is reading the review uh, sets the, the assumption. What, what are you actually reading about? I was reading a kind of a political uh, early statement that will be a kind of an invitation and call for people to come to events like this and then uh, throughout the country to start to think about what does it mean? What should we do? Okay, where do we go from, from here? If I read it as a as a different type of document that would be a kind of a, a roadmap for the new type of education in Australia, then of course this response would be very, very different. But I understand that the, the, the nature of the report is, uh, is there. I think the good thing I, I think that th this uh, review report brings is that education again becomes the kind of a national, in a way, a national priority, I hope. Uh, that it will be, it will be discussed. Uh, hopefully it will be discussed in a communities like this and in schools and, 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 and local governments so that people engage again to talk about, you know, what do we really want about uh, our schools here to do. I think the, the related positive thing that I, I see coming with this is that it, it hopefully shifts the conversation from funding issues into the kind of a content things that what type of education what type of schools do we really want to have i understand that when i, I remember the first konski discussion as long as i stayed in australia that that was only about fair funding how we distribute the, the funds and that's an extremely important part of the conversation but i think that that and i hope that that conversation will not go away i think we need to continue hearing that mm -hmm. but now the, the the thing is that there will be so many things that this report is bringing to the conversation that i think are worth uh, uh, engaging in. Some of those important things are very much that I, I, I kind of uh, created myself uh, 
uh, happily is the, the focus on early childhood education. I think it's an uh, absolutely critical thing. The, the raising kind of an importance of pedagogy, the way uh, education, teaching and learning is taking place in the school. Very good uh, assessment issues that uh, uh, Chris was talking about. And of course the leadership and the whole teacher thing over there. But I, I think the, the difficulty I have had reading this is that since this is a political report, it doesn't really clearly say things, you know, for example, what to do with the teaching or leadership or other things. And so that remains to be, uh, remains to be decided by the, the conversations uh, afterwards. Then the other one, this opportunity to do, do more, I, I, I phrase it this way, that what are the opportunities for you know, doing more, thinking more, or, or looking at more closely. I think the first thing really um, is the, uh, that what is the, uh, what is the root of the problem? And for me, as somebody who is really engaged in a kind of a systems design, systems architecture in education, I always try to help people to get into the root of the problem. What is the problem? And that's why the, the question, what is the problem here in Australian education? I, I think that the, the report could, and this conversation that starts from this report, should go much further than saying that Australia is slacking behind Singapore and Kazakhstan and all those other countries. I think that's not the problem. <laughs> uh, I think the problem is much more deeper than that. And I think the problem is uh, neither the, uh, the, the schools and teachers and how they are failing or how the, how the system is failing children, I think that's not, not the problem. The problem, problem has to be much deeper and more com complicated than that. And I think that the, the conversation that this, this report, by, by raising these issues, is launching probably, hopefully, around the country, will be able to address those things. That what is really, what are the things that are, are causing some of these symptoms that we see in the international studies and NAPLAN and many others and in the communities when we engage in conversation with parents and students. So that's something we need to uh, dig deeper. Maybe Konsky 3.0 will do this uh, <laughs> later on. Then the, um, the other one, I think that where, where much more work can be done, and, and again, this is something that the, the conversation that we are engaging now and in the future could lead us, is the, you know, how this whole thing should and could take place in the schools. Now, it's, the, the report is really not giving any kind of a guidance or advice. What is the theory of change or theory of action uh, behind this? Maybe it's not the kind of a job of the report to do that. But, you know, I was, I was kind of trying to look for whether there's any indication that by working more in, in, uh, in a kind of a way of collaboration and cooperation, you know, working together in the communities and between communities and schools, that this would be a kind of a way forward. But I, I think that the, the, the report could take this conversation further. What is the role of the collaboration and building collaborative cultures within schools and communities in addressing these things? Otherwise, if we just assume that we can, we can improve and change all these things and implement all these recommendations individually alone, I think it's going to be a very hard and difficult uh, way to do. Uh, then I think I was also kind of a, the, oh, I think that the the the, the report could do uh, go further in in telling all of us here how the this previous equity agenda can be married to all these uh, important things that are now mentioned here. The the report is actually quite silent about equity and what does it mean and how, how does it integrate into all of these things other than spending. If the assumption in the report is that equity will be fixed by spending differently, I think that's not going to be enough because all of these things that I mentioned earlier, early, early childhood and many other things are absolutely critical in both enhancing equity in Australia and through equity to enhance excellence or quality of learning outcomes. So those are some of those things. And then my personal thing that I was really curious to find in the report where I think the, the work, again, going further from here could do a huge service for your country is to make a kind of a bold recommendation. If I could add one recommendation to the list of 27 or whatever there is, my 28th would be make learning a foreign language a right for every child in Australia. And, and that's something that would be really a kind of a radical and bold and, and really, really interesting thing, but I couldn't find that over there. <laughs> and um, 
and, and, but maybe you can you can kind of like squeeze it in. And, and finally, you know, some of the open questions I, I have, uh, as, as again, as somebody who is externally looking looking at the. Um, what, what has happened and what is happening and what will happen in, in this wonderful country that will be uh, hopefully my home country very soon when I bring my children and my wife here to Sydney. And um, actually what I'm going to do as any serious scientist uh, does is to, to use my own children for a social experiment. <laughs> so I have, we have uh, two boys, uh, age three and six, and uh, we're going to send them to a public school here in Sydney and then I write research papers out of the uh, experiment. <laughs> So, so that's what's going to happen. So, but you know, one of those one of those questions that, as a reader, if I read this thing, if, you may probably share the same things. That if you go, if you read this wonderful kind of a collage of ideas and and uh, and, and things, um, is that you know, what do all these words mean there? That I, I really have to struggle. Maybe this is the fact because English is my third language, and I have to kind of a fabricate and construct the meanings of all these words, but they were like the, um, the assessment, what does it say about the assessment tools for teachers? I was like, well, so what does it mean? Personalization there, the, what does it mean uh, uh, in, this, uh, uh, in this report? And evidence, what do we mean by, what does the evidence base mean <coughs> in, the, in this thing? That it leaves so many things to be kind of decided by the reader and those who are using the report, that you know, there's a, there's a risk that people will understand these things in a different ways, um, or when there's an emphasis on basics, kind of a, kind of a focus on reading and numeracy in the early age, it, it's not clear how people will understand all these things. And you know, the, the history of education reforms globally is full. It's a clouded with the reports and research studies, exactly like this. That the intention is great and the report is beautiful. There's barely anybody there who can disagree with what the report is saying, but the implementation is horrible. Just look at the no child left behind in the United States the most recently and that's a good kind of a, uh, evidence of uh, how the good intentions can lead to very poor implementation. And I think that, that that's, that's a really a big question here is that what does all these things look like when, when they go to um, implementation. Then I think a, a critical thing, uh, how many school school teachers or leaders we have in the room here. Mm -hmm. So now I'm talking to you and you probably understand this language when I say and you, you know it's so, so easy to say in the reports like this or in uh, education policies or reform programs that the teachers and schools you have to do something more. Okay? Today I said in a newspaper that schools should begin to teach uh, safe and responsible use of mo mobile smartphones in a school. I didn't say exactly this. I actually say that they should do that, but at the same time, something should be taken away from schools. Okay? And this is a kind of a question that I have here, that if we add all these things on the top of the, everything that the schools are already doing in Australia, and you know that your school system here has the, has the longest required instruction time for children anywhere in the world. So you cannot just implement anything like this by just asking schools and teachers to do a little bit more this and that. And some of these things are really radical things, radically new things. So my question is that, so what is coming away? What, what, what is going to go away from schools when all these new wonderful things will go there? Unless you decide this, you're going to have even more tired and stressful and, and depressed teachers and principals in this school uh, than you have right now. So it's an absolutely critical question. What is going to go away when some of these new things are going to enter into the school. And this is my final point, is this, and this is really what I've been working here and hearing here in Australia during my, uh, these two weeks uh, here now, is that where is, uh, where is the focus on well-being and health of children and teachers? I couldn't see really a kind of a, there was no recommendation and there was not really a kind of an indication that, that children's, Australian children's health and well-being is at risk right now. That's what I understood from your experts and colleagues. That the, 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 st the statistics and numbers are alarming, how quickly they have been declining in this country. In Finland too, in Canada, South Korea, Singapore, all, all the other countries. And somehow, this type of large-scale, system-wide uh, <coughs> program that I, I see more as a revolution than evolution uh, should come also with a strong emphasis on enhancing 
children's well-being and health in schools and out of schools with, with parents. But this is, a, again, I, I, I leave it to you as a kind of an open question. How can we do, can we do that? Can we have a stronger focus on health and well-being and play and all those other important things within this framework? Or will those ideas will be somehow washed out when it moves from the documentation and these intentions into the implementation and practice? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, uh, Parsi, and uh, I get the great privilege of choosing the order today, and that's why I went first, because going after Parsi is always a, a very difficult ask. Um, Parsi, you will be forgiven for, given English is your third language, Yes. you will be given forgiven in Australia. We have a high tolerance level for mistaken, uh, um, uh, well, for accents and mistaken, uh, um, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, what do you know? <laughs> The French president was here recently. Have you heard this story? No, no. And he accidentally, well, maybe he didn't accidentally, call the, the uh, prime minister's wife delicious. So oh, wow. something was, uh, was lost in translation there. But um, um, she didn't seem to mind, so, you know. Uh, so I, can, I can tell you another story. I took the taxi the other day from the airport coming to the hotel and the taxi driver was driving and he said, sir, do you know how they call a, a, a person who is speaking two languages? And I think, I, I said, that I think it's a, is it bilingual? Yeah. So that's correct. How about somebody who speaks one language? I said, I have no idea. And he said, it's called Australian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry about this. This was the inappropriate part of my talk. <laughs> Monolingualism is curable. <laughs> we can fix that. Can That's something we can fix. So um, we'll take some questions, but, the, but I just forgot to mention something right at the very beginning. That is that the, uh, the Gonski Institute did not write the report. Now, we did get emails from people um, <laughs> commenting about it. Uh, kind of suggesting that we had written it. Uh, it hadn't been written by me and uh, by the by the Gonski Institute. Uh, David is the Chancellor of the University and the, the naming of the Institute is in recognition of his contribution to the University uh, and to education and, and to uh, Australia, more generally the arts uh, and business. So yes, same name, but uh, we didn't write it. So um, uh, I just I just sort of lay that out. Uh, but anyway, happy to take, uh, take some questions, question, comment. Yes. Uh, what do you think is the right age to start school? Because I can think they're late for, you know, and they so, start okay. school really young. Do you think it's too young? Well, what age would you say is too young? Too young to start. Depends what you mean by school. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like if they call a preschool here or like you go. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people, because it's expensive, they put them straight into to actual School. Yeah, well, it, I, I know that this is a kind of a hot topic in um, in this country. What, what, when should children go to school? And I was interviewed yesterday by one one of the newspapers about this, and I said it's impossible to give any answer to this. You should not look at what Finland is doing or anybody else because it depends on so many other things. You know, if you have, let me give you an example. Of what I mean, if you have a, a kind of a fully funded universal. Uh, early childhood system that we have, that we have a law that stipulates that every child has a right to safe and high quality early childhood education. Of course, it's a completely different thing to ask what time should the school start then if, you, if children have this type of thing. I know that here in many places in Australia, many parents don't have this luxury that it's cheaper to send your child to school early to save money from the from the daycare. So it's a, you, cannot, you cannot really ask this question. The other one is that school systems, if you look at the elementary schools, the first two, three grades, what the kids, how the children experience starting schooling is completely different. In some education systems, the, the day one looks like a school. You sit there and you learn mathematics and, and uh, reading and writing every day. And in, in Finland, the first uh, two years is really kind of a soft landing on play and music and, you know, learning to take care of your own things and learning to cope and deal with other kids and kind of a softly introduce literacy and numeracy and those things. So, you know, unless we know about what, what are we talking about, it's, this, this is misleading the whole conversation. So giving you any age, whether it's seven or four or five, doesn't make any, any difference. We, ha we have to see how they, what the system looks like. Yeah. Can I also add, though, that one of the problems we have, and I think the Gonski, um, Gonski report doesn't highlight this, is that an awful lot of our kids in schools in Australia 
um, start school in Australia after preschool. Uh, if you look at the language background other than English figures, it's something like 28% um, at preschool and it goes up to 36% by senior secondary school. Kids are coming into our school system without speaking English at every single year level and that's not foregrounded at all in the Gonski report but that implies that we need strong foundation, great great networks with um, parents and communities through languages other than English at every single stage of schooling. <coughs> um, it's really refreshing, Chris, to hear you talk about formative assessment and, and foregrounding formative assessment. I had a real idea from the beginning that the formative assessment um, program with something like NAPLAN or standardised testing. How do we reconcile those two oppositional ways of assessing kids? Oh, join the club. <laughs> um, the strategy in recent times has been to try and turn that plan into something that's more formative by um, improving the or reducing the time between when you get the results and you get the you can give the feedback to the kids um, making it more accessible for parents and so on but we've got to remember that the original purpose of um, NAP plan was accountability on a few key uh, indicators only a few key indicators of performance it didn't align with the curriculum it was looking at very specific aspects of numeracy and literacy. Now, there's other ways of um, get of of uh, monitoring, in a sense, how well our uh, school is delivering on some of those key numeracy and literacy things, things that are capable of being assessed by a standardised test, and there's not a lot of numeracy and literacy that is capable, actually, of being assessed by a standardised test. Um, there's ways of doing that without asking every child to sit in that plan. So um, if you look at the OECD studies, they don't assess every single child in the school system, and yet they draw conclusions about the overall uh, international performance and national performance of the kids. So you could uh, make it... Uh, a I mean, you need to modify it as well, um, but you could have a standardised test that sampled uh, a cohort of kids that was low stakes and didn't result in reports back to parents because it would be um, what it should be, which is just one snapshot, a rather poor one, but uh, one snapshot of how well an education system is performing at one particular time on one particular small set of indicators and leave the job of making high quality, comprehensive, formative assessments that will improve learning and summative assessments used for formative purposes to improve learning to the job of those who really know the teachers know the students, work with them day in and day out, and, that, and that's the teachers in partnership with the parents and the students themselves. There's some lovely rhetoric in the Gonski 2 report about students as partners for learning, and that's been a long time coming, and it's about time it was there. Um, but when when Parsi talks about no child left behind, and I think how close that is to some of the language here, I do get a bit worried so that's a very good question, I think, to keep raising. But the intention, as far as I understand it, of the um, writers of the Gonski is that we go towards a much stronger formative system because NAPLAN and standardised testing has not delivered what we need to improve student learning. Can I, can I just add to that? Um, when it came out, I wrote a thing about in the Herald about this signalling the end of NAPLAN. Uh, and, and I say that from two perspectives as a parent. So my elders did uh, year three NAPLAN last year. So I, I, I get to experience it from a parent perspective, but also at the other end, the at the pinnacle of policy, you know, implementation, development, etc. As as a minister, and um, you know, I, I think where this is going to is a better way of actually providing the information that I get through NAPLAN testing. Uh, given its inaccuracies and the various other problems with it. Why I think it's the end is because this is signalling what's going to replace it. But there still will need to be, because the parents want to know that. I mean, I, I, my kids go to the country school and I want to make sure that, you know, whilst my son might be doing all right in maths in his class in Griffith, 
how does his performance compare to Bondi Public School mm. or any other school in, 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 in New South Wales or Australia? So in that sense, it gives me my, my child's results in a, con in a context, in a national context. I value it as a parent. I think parents value it. Mm. But when it's trying to do two, th one, one test trying to do two things, so I think when it was basic skills, it was, it was seen as reasonably valuable by teachers and schools. When they used it to try and do something else, mm. which is the system check, system evaluation, and, you know, mm. I mean, I was looking the, the other day, the reason it got, the reason the My School website got up was to drive change through competition between schools, drive educational change. And it certainly hasn't achieved that, and the unintended consequences, you could certainly argue, uh, outweighed any potential benefits. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think it, end, it ends that, but there still has to be some kind of system in place mm -hmm. because from a minister's perspective and from system leaders, you want to check the system. You want to know how you know, kids in regional New South Wales are doing. You want to know all that information, but it doesn't need to be every kid in year three, every kid in year five. Uh, there's, a, there's a better way to do that. So uh, there's certainly, and look, you know, Mark Scott was out there today talking about it. You know, Rob Stokes is out there, the minister saying, let's get rid of it. I mean, the momentum is such that it, it is going to end. Uh, I'll, I'll take a question from up there. I think I'll... Yeah? Oh, let me... <coughs> Easy this way. Yeah, welcome. Hello, it's Jill Duncan from the University of Newcastle. Um, my um, thoughts are that the report really goes into great detail about teacher professional learning. And as um, you noted, the next step really is for government to make a response to the report. So if you could imagine that the three of you were invited to the table to assist the government to respond to the recommendations regarding teacher professional learning and ensuring that uh, resources were available to teachers, including time within the work week to complete their professional learning, how would you go about convincing government to, um, to accept that recommendation? The, there are a series of recommendations that include this. So how would you go about convincing the government to, um, to accept those recommendations? Um, look, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good question. And um, I mean, to do the kind of formative assessment that they talk about does take, does take substantial time. And you have to invest additional resources into, into time. Uh, you know, again, if you look at Finland, you, you mentioned before, the amount of um, non, well, however you describe it, the amount of face-to-face -face or non-face-to-face -face is significantly different, different to, to, us, to uh, here in Australia. So, yeah, at a political level, you have to make the political case about providing teachers with less time in front of, in front of children. Now, not necessarily an easy case to make politically. You can make that case here. Everybody's in heated agreement. But, um, you know, there, there will be certain elements out there who will say that that's a waste of money by giving teachers time away from face-to-face -face teaching. But that is the single most important thing I think you can invest in. And if you're going to do these things, you know, the time to determine the individual learning progressions of however many 10, 15, 25 students in front of you takes time. The, the kind of <laughs> the, the kind of the kind of um, professional learning that they that they talk about in Gonski, but the one that you know is valuable, the in school professional development, the observation, the, the peer work that you do together, that all requires teachers to be away from face to face teaching. And you know, it does get sometimes a heated political argument because even parents will say, you know, my my kid's teacher is away from their class because when they were a child, when they were a student 30 years ago, you had one teacher from nine o'clock in the morning to in primary, one until three o'clock, uh, and and they rarely kind of stepped out of the classroom, and it's not the reality these days. That's why it is a difficult argument. That's why some of these arguments around these funding agreements, what are they going to make states do? How much pushback will states? 
give to some of the kind of what they see as command and control. Um, everybody hates command and control unless you're the one commanding and controlling, right? Um, you know, principals shouldn't laugh at that either because... Uh, um, so I think that's going to be the kind of political challenge around this. You know, if you're going to make this happen, you have to buy time for teachers, and that can be controversial. But it does require courage. Yeah. Can I say quickly that it's a great question, actually. My advice would to the minister would be to um, establish a professional capital investment fund for teachers. And rather than think kind of a conventionally, how, how, do, we, how do we get all the teachers uh, trained or retrained for these purposes? And there are good examples around the world of this type of uh, kind of a slipped, uh, of lipped, uh, approach where the money will, would go to the clusters of schools based on the, the teachers and schools' needs, what, how they want to engage and, and, and engage in professional learning. Um, and for example, if you look at the, the province of Alberta in Canada, they, they invested uh, half a billion dollars in this type of uh, initiative uh, a few years ago. And that is one reason why Alberta schools and teach, uh, students have been doing so well in these international comparisons, because the investment that went directly to the end users uh, was well well spent. So that, that would be my, my advice, probably together with some other forms of professional learning. But I think that the the, um, the kind of a challenge from moving again from this, uh, the ideas of the reports for supporting teachers and schools and principals to the actual practice is that if it if it's translated in a kind of a human capital development only. In other words, if the assumption is that by training teachers, giving them more training and in-service training and courses will do the thing, it doesn't. It has to go through investing in teams of teachers and groups of teachers collectively. That's why I call it a professional capital fund that includes human capital and social capital as well. So that would be my advice. And, and, and I'll, I mean, you've asked me the question now, are you going to get me ranting about it, but, you know, I would, my advice would be, you, you, you've, got, you've commissioned a report, I would triangulate it with the profession in terms of the implementation issue, right? You've got a report, okay, here's the implementation. Get the profession on, on board with you, because if you try and do it without them, they'll, they'll go, yes, yes, and, you know, put it in the bottom drawer. Get the profession on site and then make a decision and stick to it for 10 years, not for one year. I mean, you know, politically... And look, and I, I'm probably guilty of it too, but, you know, these, you know, you get, you get, you get muscled by, oh, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a confessional to, 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 you know, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's so easy these days, you get muscled by the Daily Telegraph and, you know, everybody goes to water. But there's also this longevity argument that, yeah. that people in, in that, that in, in politically in education, people are unwilling to make. You can, you can argue the case, and I've used this example before. The Northwest Rail Link, we've spent billions of dollars, not a single passenger has travelled on it, right? Are we, are we saying we should stop because not a single passenger? You know, these things in education take time to take effect, like building a train line. But in education, we think, oh, we've done that for two years and it hasn't changed in our plan results, so let's do something completely different. So my advice would be stick to it. So are you suggesting we take education out of the hands of the politicians and give it back to the professionals? <laughs> sure. Um, sure. Sure, but I don't think you want it. I don't think you want it, right? Because, you know, edu education politics is not just the people in this room, right? It's the four million parents, right? It's, you don't want it. You, you actually want to give it to the politicians, right? But you just hope that they would do things, you know, responsibly with it in the right, in, in the right way and have the courage to make the arguments for it. Yeah. Well, my Chinese colleagues last week asked me, was this part of your... Was Gongski too part of your 10-year plan for education? <laughs> and I said, well, we lost, stopped doing 10-year plans a long time ago. And that's actually one of the problems, I think, that we're suffering from now is the lack of, you know, you talk about a roadmap, but the lack of a, a very clear and coherent long-term roadmap. Um, and some of the countries that are doing exceptionally well are... are uh, dictatorships or <laughs> near dictatorships or whatever. Talking so there is Finland? something. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about Finland. Or oh, Canada. Come on, so we'll think about Canada. <laughs> <laughs> no, the gentleman over here on my right.
Thank you, Parsi. I was quite um, heartened by your suggestion that uh, teacher welfare should be part of uh, Gonski. Um, I'm going to make a guess here and say I'm the only casual or temporary teacher in the room. Would that be right? <laughs> no. Oh, good on you. All right. I'd like to ask a question on, of the panel on behalf of 48,000 casual and temporary employees in the department and virtually every <laughs> new graduate. Uh, the situation is not uh, as, as you might think. 48,000 casual and temporary staff in New South Wales, virtually every new graduate is subjected to, or brutalised by, you might say, years and potentially decades of insecure employment. Mm. And the reality of that insecure employment is that um, new graduates uh, may be hired or fired at the whim of the school executive without oversight by the department, without recourse or remedy under departmental procedures. And what that means is, regardless of how unfairly you've been treated, there is absolutely no way, as a casual or temporary teacher, that you will get restitution. Now, how do I know that? Because I've proven it. I've proven it by taking a case, a relatively simple, predictable case, from uh, a regional high school, uh, with concerns about the conduct of an acting head teacher, and I've traced it all the way through the department, right through to Mark Scott, identifying 25 to 30 serious breaches of due process and procedure um, without any possibility of recourse or remedy. And that's the official position of the department. There is no remedy available to me in particular but to any of the 48,000 staff, regardless of how well you've been, how badly you've been treated. So my question is to Parsi, what proportion of Finnish teachers are in insecure employment without recourse in the event that they're uh, treated unfairly? And what consequence do you think building an education system on a generation of new graduates without rights at work, what consequence does that have for quality teaching? The, th uh, yeah, the first question, I don't know, uh, probably a few, uh, I, I would say probably less than 2% of the, the teaching staff. The second question is, uh, for me, it's equally difficult to answer than if I was asking you that, w what is your favorite style of cross-country skiing? <laughs> because I have no idea what to say to that. Maybe I can, I can ask, uh, ask my colleagues to, to answer this, because we, we don't really experience anything like this. Yeah, but, and, and the reason that, that in Finland it, it doesn't happen, happen, happen to it the same degree is because your, your workforce planning and management exactly. is much tighter than here. You know, in four years' time, you know, you need 600 teachers, you enrol 600 teachers into IT. Yeah, yeah. Here we graduate 5,000 a year out of all the universities in New South That's Wales, right, right. and we have 150 permanent positions. Yeah. I mean, is this... It, it, it's not the same. Like you said well, before, it's actually, not the same. The department doesn't know how many teachers it needs, and that's part of the problem as well. Um, the workforce planning is, is dire, so that figure of casual and temporary includes everybody, people like me. Um, anybody who wants to be on the list uh, to be accredited has to be on that list, and if they're not currently employed, they're counted as casual or, or you know, temporary or whatever. Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of problems with that list. Um, uh, yeah, so, but there is a... I'm going to go. I'm, I'm going to go to Murray up here. I mean, we, we can't solve an individual problem. I'll give you a copy of the evidence and work with you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Look, I'd go back. I'd like to go back to the the Gonski recommendations, if we could. It's Murray Mulheron from the New South Wales Teachers Federation. Um, we're pleased that there's some recommendations in there that go to 
are looking at how we assess our children um, that could potentially replace NAPLAN, which after 10 years, uh, we now have had um, the teaching profession have been saying for 10 years it's, a, it's been an appalling instrument. Um, and it actually corresponds with a decline in, in, um, in student achievement. And we say there's a causal relationship for that. So it's good to see that there's a potential for a uh, new assessment uh, instruments. I wasn't going to say the word tools. I'm a little bit sick of that kind of uh, industrial metaphor. Um, I think teachers don't need um, <laughs> extra spanners. They need people to hand them the spanner. Um, but I think an, an unhelpful note, this is what I'd like the panel to comment on, an unhelpful term in this is the word diagnostic. It's a kind of medical analogy. Our kids are not sick. They are not going to school to be cured. Um, and this notion that you can have some kind of assessment instrument about finding out what's wrong or taking the temperature of a child as though there's some kind of illness really perverts, in my opinion, the notion of what assessment is, which is a much more complicated, sophisticated kind of um, thing that teachers do with their kids, as opposed to snapshots, blood tests, urine tests, and even any other kind of medical test that it has. So I'm asked, to, do you think there's potential with the Gonski recommendations where we would move away from the notion that assessment is somehow diagnosing a problem as opposed to assessing for learning? Yeah, no, no I, I'm an optimist, so um, <laughs> I would I would assume that there's lots of potential and room for manoeuvre here, um, but we need to get, get our concepts and terminology really clear. It doesn't surprise me that the Gonski report um, is not always coherent in terms of its language because it's a written by a number of different people of different perspectives and persuasions and it's in response to a, a number of submissions, a huge range of submissions and consultations from a range of people. So some of the language is not necessarily consistent and it's not necessarily as helpful and it certainly isn't theoretically consistent. Um, but I think it's very clear that it's talking about formative assessment, um, which I am conceptualising as the best kind of assessment for learning kind of approaches to assessment. And I think the quicker everybody else tells them that that's what we understand by it, the, 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 the quicker you can pin everything down. Um, tools I don't have a problem with, but then I'm a Vygotskyan, and Vygotsky is into tools in a big way, uh, not the spanner and uh, wrench sort, and certainly not the hammer sort, but um, the language is sometimes um, difficult. Now, the lady, the great jumper, had a hand up before, no? Yeah? Um, and then there's a gentleman up the middle, up the back there. Pardon, anyway. yeah. Given that we know teachers are stressed out, I think everyone can agree to that, and there are more obligations being piled into teachers. We're also saying that we need to hear their voice strongly represented in the rhetoric here. How do we do that? How do we capture the everyday teacher who doesn't have the time or capacity to attend something like this, or to engage in the thinking that is going on around, going on around this decision making and all the sort of how many everyday teachers have we got? How many people identify as everyday teachers? <laughs> Nobody that side of the room. What's that side of the room? <laughs> <laughs> principles. Principles. Oh, extraordinary teachers. <laughs> yeah, so... Even even at a time like this, on a Tuesday evening after you've been to staff meetings, the goodness knows what, you've managed to get here. I think, and this has been um, live streamed and recorded for posterity, um, so I think I think there are, we just need to make more and more opportunities for this kind of connection between um, grassroots teachers, policy makers, principals, all the people on that side of the room, whoever they are, <laughs> you know, and make your voices heard. And I think that's one thing we agreed the Gonski Institute could be very, very good at is connecting all the dots and helping um, people from very different perspectives understand and listen and come together and talk through these issues. So the gentleman up the 
back. <laughs> Join the union. <laughs> the gentleman at the back there. Um, I'd like to sort of hark back in a sense to one of the things that uh, Marty can, can you take the microphone? So oh, sorry, sure. Yeah, I thought yeah, I was thank going you. okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you. <laughs> As I said, I'd like to hark back to uh, a statement that Parsi made a little earlier about equity, but I'd also sort of contentiously, uh, the conspiracy theorist in me would like to say that, um, in a way, I really applaud what Chris said about NAPLAN, you know, being misused and used for its uh, cross purposes, and and that being the issue rather than. The, of the instrument itself, perhaps, you know. And one of the glaring things that, that it showed, and perhaps through the translation across again into my school, was that, uh, and this is not being too partisan, but the public system, the value adding in the public system mm -hmm. compared to mm -hmm. the independent schools is markedly uh, greater, you know, far, far, far greater. And to me, I think what it's done is it revealed a politically uh, uncomfortable circumstance. So I can sort of see some fairly political reasons for the death of... Uh, that plan, you know, so I think that's an interesting little aside, but maybe it, it, it harkens back to the original question that I should have asked, which was, I'm sorry, was about equity and um, in, with the Emperor's New Clothes view that Parsi sort of spoke about, what he might recommend and, and what everyone might say is uh, the most immediate steps that Australia could take towards its greatest ill, which really is the equity gap and continues to be. It's your question, Parsi. Is it mine? Yeah. <laughs> you. That's well, a big I, I, question. You, I'm sorry, yeah, I, I realise that. that. This is so, no, no, the question is so easy that even Adrian can answer this, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's right. No, I, you know, I, I think, as I said earlier in my introductory remarks, that I, I, I truly hope that when the, when the conversation continues from here, that the, this equity theme and what the Konski's first review brought along about equitable funding and this whole definition of what what is equity and why is it important will be blended into this conversation. Uh, my fear, uh, honestly, is that there are people here who will say that, but we already have, you know, dealt with equity, and now we can now let's build this excel, uh, kind of excellence uh, thing here. I think what is absolutely critical. This is again what the Konsky Institute here is is trying to uh, facilitate and accelerate uh, throughout the province and country actually is the the continued conversation and debate in the communities and families and schools and and in the nation about the the importance of equity i'm i'm not convinced that everybody would be absolutely clear why we should care about equity why is it is, is it a kind of a smart idea to keep alive um, and why equity is much more than just uh, keep you know uh, share funding and resources fairly and inclusively and uh, y you know out, out of that conversation will come something that the the Konski 2.0 is not um, is not clear about is what this equity could look like what, what it should look like and I you know, when, when I read this report I can see that there are many things that can be done but it's the report is not clearly saying that these things are important for building more equitable and more equal system of education in Australia. That's something, that job has been left to the people and their conversations to do. But I see the opportunity there, but I also see the, the risk that this will be not done if we are not taking care of that conversation. Uh, and, and, if, and if I can add to that, um, you know, the appeal to me about the involvement with the, with the Institute is around this, this issue of equity. And you know, Parsi has been a great champion for a long time on this issue and you know we we uh, we in New South Wales as the minister being fortunate to be the minister at the time when the first report came out and to to have been um, you know involved with a lot of people in this room uh, making that case about equitable funding needs-based funding the governments can do two things they can invest money into equity uh, and they can in invest uh, policy uh, power in equity and now, we've started down the path of money, more to do, but it's the policy power that is the other element of this, and this is my particular interest in my involvement with the Gonski Institute. And, you know, at a, can I just say at a political level, it resonates. I know conservatives sometimes don't think that, and people are often surprised that I'm a former National Party MP and I would be such a champion of equity, given country electorates are some of the most disadvantaged in the country, it's no surprise, but it resonates politically. Uh, when we came into government in 2011, 
when they do polling on issues, we were like minus 40 in education. You know, we were like plus 20 on transport and various other things. We are minus 40. Um, about 18 months ago, the last time I saw the numbers, we were about zero. No, you know, we're not in front, but we're about zero. You know, when you so at a political level, it, it does actually make policy sense and it makes political sense. And as Paul Keating says, Paul Keating said, you know, good policy is good politics. So, you know, it's, your question is exactly right. Uh, that's the reason we're here and we're involved in the Institute and to take the opportunity to take this second report and, you know, make, make the case, all of us here, about this, about governments using their policy power to advance equity in this country. Thank you. Sorry. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I've been a principal for 11 years of a school that's on the fifth percentile of the ICSEA ratings in central Queensland, um, and I'm here representing the Queensland Teachers Union. Um, I want to talk about Chapter 2 because one of the things that I'm really scared of, having watched for the last 25 years bureaucrats and politicians take reviews like this and turn it into work for us, <laughs> is um, <laughs> what heinous acts could be done with the recommendations around curriculum. We have just had a curriculum review of the Australian curriculum, which was agreed, you know, the Australian curriculum was negotiated nationwide. In 2016, we had a second review. We haven't implemented that yet. I've been and looked at the curricula of the nine countries that outperformed us in all three dimensions on 2015 PISA, and none of them do anything like what is recommended in the Gonski review. New Zealand's the closest, but it's slipped as many places as us. I actually can't see any causal link between our performance and the curriculum. I can with, with the professionalism of teachers. I can with time for our teachers to learn together. But the curriculum is the risk that we teachers see out in our classrooms and that's what's going to make our lives a misery. I'm just interested in your comments. Go, Chris. That was his aim directly at you. Uh, so I'll just, I think I agree. <laughs> um, I think part of the problem, and, and uh, you know, I can get stuck into politicians again. We can get um, part of the problem is that if, if something's initiated politically in two years ago, the politicians think it's been done. Whereas for the rest of us, you know, we're still at the consultation stage, maybe at the piloting stage. It hasn't even rolled out yet. Um, uh, this is a phenomenon we're constantly experiencing. So it, it kind of goes back to, you know, you're talking about theory of change. I think we really need to give our um, politicians a really sound lesson on th implementation theory and theory of change and I mean lucky the Gonsk I can put in a plug can I the Gonski Institute has some good friends so we're having Andy Hargraves coming we're having Michael Fullan etc who are the kind of gurus on educational innovation and change but even some of my dictator friends from um, f to the north of us uh, <laughs> Sing recorded, Singapore you know. Sorry, Singapore people. <laughs> no, I meant secretly recorded. <laughs> I read something about in the past. I mean, yeah. Uh, Singapore wouldn't dream of implementing anything without 10 years' notice for its teachers. You know, they, they work in 10 year cycles, and I work with them on the plan. Um, for the 10 years that finished in 2018 and then they turned around to, to start the next 10-year plan, you know, in, in 2008 to plan ahead. You know, so they, they work very long-term and they allow things to bed down and settle. So I think generally that's a weakness of the Australian system and I blame the politicians and the political cycle. Yeah, they're awful, they're awful. Now, let, let, me, let me give a very quick uh, quick uh, response to this because, you know, there's one interesting uh, statement there in the beginning of uh, the report that says that Australia has to do away the industrial model of schooling. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking hard, that what does it mean and you know, one of the one of the understandings I have about the industrial model that is something that is a kind of a top-down design that there's somebody who gives a very detailed instructions and guidelines and directions for people what how to perform in a production, and that's the industrial model. So doing away that would mean for me, I, I read it that it, we will turn it around and just provide a kind of a, a overall 
general framework for schools and then the, the curriculum work actually would be done by schools, probably schools collectively. Uh, where the decision what to teach, how to teach, how to design programs and other things would be the, the responsibility of the school to decide. This is exactly how Finland has been doing that for the last 25 years. Every school has their own curriculum. And if you ask Finnish teachers whether it's a kind of a good idea, everybody says it's a great idea, not only because they can, everybody will teach really the things that they love to teach, that think is good for their kids, but they also have much more ownership and agency in their work when they are doing something that they, they have collectively designed and decided that this is what we need to do. So that would be an option. Why don't you communicate this, indust doing away the industrial model in that way, that it means also the kind of a new type of curriculum design for the schools. Sorry, we had you here. Yeah, because you raised the issue of what is the root of the problem. And some people have been talking about what the root of the problem might be. And from my perspective, I grew up in Denmark, where we have a very uniform education system. And then I raised three teenagers here in Australia, and I kind of saw the other side to it. I think one of the big problems is that it's so fragmented. You have a very diverse population. 25% of us are not even born here. And then you have the public and the private system. And then on top of that, you have the state-funded education system, but dictated to from the federal government as to what the things should be. I mean, there's just so many different components to it that it's never going to be one homo homogeneous sort of uh, institution. And just in terms of, if Gonski one was in introduced in 2011, we're seven years on, and Parsi was talking about uh, what should we be doing? How long would it actually take to work out what we should be doing? And then how to implement it? And then, then how is this growth of a child going to be assessed? Because the propaganda we got from the outside mainly talks about counting numeracy and literacy and not really about growth of a child, which does, doesn't seem to be a lot of focus on in Australia. Good points. Uh, the question there. And We'll go for the question at the back. And then the Vice-Chancellor might actually get the last question. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm Emma. I'm from UNSW. Uh, so building off the sort of recurring theme about time for teachers, um, I was wondering if the panel could speak to the importance of support staff, so things like ESL teachers, counselors, speech pathologists, in-class aides, and how they can support teaching as excellence, but also how they sort of figure into the Gonski recommendations, because there's a big focus on teachers, but not necessarily all the support staff that comes with that. Well, who wants to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you want to say something? Well, let's, let's take the, uh, the vice chancellor. Oh, um, oh well, we to answer to that to question, I mean, there. to respond to that question, okay. not answer it. Oh, um, I, I think, I mean, one of our concerns in the Gonski Institute is there's so much emphasis on the individual bits of school and not enough emphasis on the educational community and everybody who has to work together to improve learning for kids, including kids themselves, parents and caregivers, members of the community, including owners of businesses and things like that, the support staff in a, in a school, um, and the teachers and, and school leaders themselves, as well as the, the policy makers and so on. So um, one thing we, we absolutely must focus on is making the educational community um, providing opportunities for them to talk to each other and to act in one voice rather than diverse groups. Uh, Mark Marshall from uh, School of Education, New University of New South Wales. Um, I just wanted to pick up a, a point, a comment that Chris made about the invisibility of second language learners in the Gonski Review report. Um, it's not unusual for reports of this kind because they tend to say that the universal strategies they apply are apply to everybody and therefore are inclusive of everybody. But it's particularly pointed in this particular case because uh, the emphasis on the assessment tools. Mm. And we know that the, the, the right tools matter when it's, it comes to second language learners. Um, and it was particularly pointed, I think, because there was a tool available for assessing and looking at progress for second language learners through the ACARA ELD continuum, progress continuum. Um, but this was not picked up in the report. So it seems to be a kind of a case where the policy, by ignoring diversity, creates potentially a disadvantage out of that diversity. Um, and the second point I wanted to make was, as I was reading the, the report, I was really struck 
um, I had a flashback basically to the early 1990s and uh, Chris will probably, maybe she had those flashbacks too. Um, uh, we, we, Australia went through uh, uh, two or three years of the uh, uh, national curriculum profile and assessment process. Um, and what that, what that was involved was the writing and the putting into the genre of proficiency scales uh, all of the uh, key learning areas. And it seems to me this is, uh, that was presided over by Ken Boston. Ken Boston's also a, a key player in the Gonski uh, panel. It seemed to me that uh, are we having a rerun of this agenda yet again? And we know that that, that agenda collapsed very quickly after uh, its rushed implementation. Uh, in fact, the ESL scales was the only survivor of that entire process. Um, so I'd be interested to hear your comments on that sort of policy history. Michael, you're talking to your colleague here. <laughs> yeah, so, um, again, I, I mean, we're optimists, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, so I'd like to think that it won't be a, a rerun of the 1990s, that we've learnt something from that. But I think the more that we can talk to people and um, build on history and use things that remind people of what didn't work, talk, show them examples of what did work, the better. Now, we're going to have one, oh, we, we've only got one time for one more question and it, it is the, uh, you know, we are in the Vice-Chancellor's, um, you know, yes, university. Yeah, but you know, it's always the it's always the student up the back that asks the tricky yeah. question right at the end. <laughs> I, I think you're pretty safe, but, but thanks, <laughs> thanks, yeah. Adrian. I, I I do have I was going to keep quiet, but I do have two comments and a question. Um, my comments, uh, my first comment is that it is fantastic for this university to be hosting so many people from the teaching profession. It's really exciting, and it just reminds me about our commitment at UNSW to do much, much more than we're doing right now to ensure equity of admission and enrolment at our university. We are, we're on a long journey there, but we are absolutely committed to it and we will make sure it happens. Join our 2025 strategy. We have a long way to go. <laughs> Second comment is, what a thrill to see the Gonski Institute for Education in action and to see the three of you on the same platform. It's fantastic. And, and thanks for a, a really great discussion with just a touch of controversy as well. So it's absolutely <laughs> Singaporeans will be here tomorrow. Yeah. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> my question, my question is, um, I want to try and tempt you to talk about post-secondary or higher education. Um, and, and two parts to that. First of all, what do you think the implications are of the Gonski II report for post-secondary and higher education? And my second, second part of that is, do you think that we need a similar rep report or review for post-secondary and higher education as is being advocated by the Australian Labour Party? Paz is going first. Come on, Paz. No, I, don't know about I, I, I would love to say something, but I simply don't know enough about the... Uh, anything I would say would be next to nonsense. So yeah. I remain silent. Yeah. That's a Finnish yeah. way, anyway. Yeah. Um, well, we definitely need to improve the quality of learning and teaching in universities. That's a given. And we have a lot of the same challenges, a lot of the same discussions and debates... Um, and we definitely need to, um, in a sense, professionalise uh, the teaching force in universities so that they are focusing much more on taking a accountability for ensuring that every student can achieve. Uh, if we take students in, they deserve a, a strong education. So I think there's a lot more we can do, but some of my colleagues over there involved in learning and teaching may want to add to that, um, the Deputy Vice-Chancellor <laughs> Academic in charge of learning and teaching in the university might want to say something. <laughs> can I? Can I oh, come on. Please. Thank you. This is such a lovely present to have. <laughs> so, so, Chris, uh, hello at home. Uh, so, Chris is right. We are actually very aware that we need to do better for our students. What we have done very well in this country is done better for more students. More students are coming to our university than ever before. And as the Vice-Chancellor says, we need to make sure that we have equity 
in entry and we provide as many opportunities as possible. I think that has been a huge triumph of this and all Australian universities. Weight against that, have we maintained the standard of teaching, the student experience at the level that we've wanted to? In some ways, we've offered excellent education because we have some of the smartest, most dedicated staff come out all day and night <laughs> working, people dedicated to the research and dedicated to the students. But we are introducing education-focused staff who will be able to go all the way to professor just by dedicating their entire careers to teaching and not being expected to simultaneously be doing research at the moment. You can bat you can bowl, you can be an administrator like me, a fielder. <laughs> you can do whatever, but you don't have to always be doing both and professionalising that. But we also want to learn from people outside the university and bring them in and people who are educationalists. So thanks for the last word. So, no, no, but can, I, can, I add, can I add something to that, Ian? I'll, I'll, give, you my, I'll give you my politician's answer. Um, so I'm a poli former politician of almost 20 years and six minute, years as an education minister. And I've just looked inside the door of universities and this is my initial observation, which I did pass on to the Secretary of the Department of Education in Canberra for good or for bad. It'll, it'll obviously depend on what I'm about to say. But, you know, I think a review like this is, like they've done with Gonski, is, is absolutely necessary in higher education because I think all of the motivators are in the wrong direction. Now, what's the motivation for universities? It's to enrol international students because of funding, uh, to enrol domestic students, look at the proliferation of um, um, some universities, not this one, in enrolling just, you know, thousands of students into, into courses like teaching. You know, it's relatively inexpensive to produce, but it's a great revenue raiser. And the consequences that it might have on quality and various other things. Um, you know, universities are very motivated by rankings. Uh, and does that drive wrong, uh, incorrect decision making for, for universities? Um, you know, researchers are very motivated by um, because their accountability is around you know, publications and citations and, and various other things. Um, I, I don't know the answer to any of these questions, but this is my five seconds involved in a university and looking at what are the things that are drive people's decision making. And I'm just not sure that they align with necessarily that national interest around what we would want out of universities. Which you know, which is the research and the training and the development of blah blah blah. You know, I think we do do a good job in Australia in getting um, getting um, students into university who previously didn't have access. New South Wales, I think it's about forty four percent of students. You know, we have a role in education to um, assist students as they come through schools into into higher education, into vet and other things. Um, the whole equity issue. I come from six hundred kilometres away from here and. The nearest university is 200 kilometres away, and you can be the smartest kid in school, but and it's not the cost of the fees, it's the cost of relocating. Uh, and there's a huge equity issue there if you are the smartest kid in the school. So, yeah, lots of, there's, there's certainly lots of things that they could look at, Ian. Uh, so uh, I think it would be very uh, worth doing. Um, I'm just not sure David Gonski would be, uh, I'd be definitely the person not <laughs> who wouldn't want to do it. But yeah, I, you know, this, that's my five minutes of uh, observation in inside universities. Anyway, thank you again. Thank you, thank you again for thank you again for coming along uh, and participating to the vice chancellor for coming for some of the deputy vice chancellors and other senior executive from the university who supported tonight. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, and again, I hope you got something out of it. Uh, we certainly did. Uh, and uh, we look forward to you uh, coming along to uh, future events like this. And we will be having uh, four follow-up panel sessions uh, in the coming months, one a month, uh, following up some of the specific recommendations of the Gonski 2 report. So um, stay tuned for that. First one's in June, yep. last week of June.